please, please turn your microphone on. I am indeed Dr. Robert Epstein. The most important thing for you to know about me is that I'm the father of five wonderful children. As it happens, I'm also a research psychologist at the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology. I have been center, center left my whole adult life, but I value my country and democracy more than I value any party or candidate. That is why I'm speaking out today. I'm here to explain why Google poses a serious threat to democracy, how monitoring systems can protect us from companies like Google, and how Congress can immediately end Google's worldwide monopoly on search. My plan for ending that monopoly was published just yesterday in Business Week. I respectfully request that my article be entered into the congressional record. It's attached to my full testimony. Uh, it will be entered without objection. I've been a research psychologist for nearly 40 years. My PhD is from Harvard, and since 1981, I've published extensively on AI and other topics. Some of my research has focused on Google, on the company's massive surveillance operations, censorship capabilities, and unprecedented ability to manipulate the thinking of 2.5 billion people, soon to be four plus billion. I've written article, articles about Google for Time Magazine, USA Today, that kind of thing, but also for The Daily Caller and even Russia's Sputnik News. I reach out to diverse audiences because I believe the threats posed by Google, and to a lesser extent Facebook, are so serious that everyone needs to know about them. Here are just three disturbing findings from my research which adheres to the very highest standards of scientific integrity. Number one, in 2016, Google's search algorithm likely impacted undecided voters in a way that shifted at least 2.6 million votes to Hillary Clinton, whom I supported. I know this because I preserved more than 13,000 election-related searches prior to Election Day, and Google's search results were significantly biased in favor of Secretary Clinton. I know the number of votes that shifted because I've conducted dozens of controlled experiments that measure how opinions shift when search results are biased. I call this shift SEAM, the Search Engine Manipulation Effect, which I first published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2015. Biased search results can easily produce shifts in the opinions and voting preferences of undecided voters by up to 80% in some demographic groups because people blindly trust high-ranking search results over lower ones. SEAM is an especially dangerous form of influence because it is, in effect, subliminal. It also leaves no paper trail for authorities to trace. It's an example of a short-lived or, quote, ephemeral experience. That's a phrase you'll find in internal emails that have leaked recently from Google. I'm now studying seven such manipulations, like SEAM, and unlike billboards or those Russian-placed ads, these manipulations are invisible and non-competitive. They're controlled entirely by big tech companies, and there is no way to counteract them. Number two, on election day in 2018, the Go Vote reminder that Google displayed on its home page gave one political party at least 800,000 more votes than it gave the other party. That reminder was not a public service. It was a vote manipulation. Number three, in the weeks leading up to the 2018 election, bias in Google's search results may have shifted upwards of 78.2 million votes spread across many races to the candidates of one political party. This number is based on bias in data captured by my 2018 monitoring system, which preserved more than 47,000 election-related searches conducted by a diverse group of American voters. I know how to stop big tech in its tracks, and that brings me briefly here to monitoring systems and the proposal I published yesterday. A 2015 phone call from the Attorney General of Mississippi prompted me to start a years-long project in which I have learned how to capture online ephemeral experiences 
In early 2016, I deployed a system that allowed my team to look over people's shoulders as they conducted online searches with their permission. I deployed a more sophisticated system in 2018, and I'm raising funds now to build a much more comprehens comprehensive system in 2020, one that will allow us to catch big tech in the act to instantly spot when Facebook is biasing news feeds or when Twitter is suppressing tweets sent by Ann Coulter or Elizabeth Warren. This system must be built to keep an eye on big tech in 2020 because if these companies all support the same candidate, they will have the power to shift 15 million votes to that candidate. To let big tech get away with subliminal manipulation on this scale would be to make the free and fair election meaningless. Finally, regarding yesterday's article, Congress can quickly end Google's worldwide monopoly on search by declaring Google's massive search index, the database the company uses to generate search results, to be a public commons, accessible, accessible by all, just as a 1956 consent decree forced AT&T to share all its patents. There is precedent in both law and Google's business practices to justify taking this step, which will make online search competitive again and dramatically diminish Google's power worldwide. In 1961, Eisenhower warned about the possible rise of a technological elite that would control public policy without people's awareness. That elite now exists, and you must determine where we go from here. Chairman Cruz, Ranking Member Hirono, Mrs. Blackburn, other members of the committee, democracy as originally conceived cannot survive big tech as currently empowered. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for that fascinating testimony. Um, Senator Blackburn has asked that she might go earlier, so I'll yield my time to her and I'll ask my questions uh, later in this round. Um, Dr. Epstein, I, I found your testimony incredibly powerful and incredibly concerning. And, and if anyone draws news out of this hearing, I would encourage you to review very carefully Dr. Epstein's testimony. And I'd like to take a moment to make clear several things. First of all, a, a, as I understand your background, uh, you're not a Republican, and, and, and nor are you a conservative. Is that accurate? <clears throat> that would be an understatement. Um, and, in, and indeed, you're the former editor-in-chief of Psychology Today. Correct. So you're a respected academic. You testified before this committee that Google's manipulation of votes gave at least 2.6 million additional votes to Hillary Clinton in the year 2016. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and I want to make sure I understand, you personally supported and voted for Hillary Clinton. I was a very strong public supporter of Hillary Clinton, yes. So you're not dis dismayed that people voted for her, but your testimony is that Google is, through bias in search results, manipulating voters in a way they're not aware of. On a massive scale, and what I'm saying is that I believe in democracy, I believe in the free and fair election, uh, more than I have any kind of allegiance to a candidate or a party. And looking forward, if I understood your testimony correctly, you said in subsequent elections, Google and Facebook and Twitter and big tech's manipulation could manipulate as many as 15 million votes in a subsequent election? In 2020, if all these companies are supporting the same candidate, there are 15 million votes on the line that can be shifted without people's knowledge and without leaving a paper trail for authorities to trace. Now, now, you described the go vote reminder, and you said it wasn't a public service announcement, but rather manipulation. Can you explain how? Uh, I'm not sure everyone followed the details of that. Well, sure. Um, if on election day in 2016, if Mark Zuckerberg, for example, had chosen to send out a go vote reminder, say, just to Democrats, and no one would have known if he had done this, that would have given that day an additional at least 450,000 votes to Democrats. And we know this without doubt because of Facebook's own published data because they did an experiment that they didn't tell anyone about 
during the 2010 election. They published it in 2012. It had 60 million Facebook users involved. They sent out a go vote reminder and they got something like 360,000 more people to get off their sofas and go vote who otherwise would have stayed home. The point is, I don't think that Mr. Zuckerberg sent out that reminder uh, in 2016. I think he was overconfident. I think Google, Google was overconfident. They, all these companies were. Uh, I don't think he sent that out. Without monitoring systems in place, we'll never know what these companies are doing. But the point is, in 2018, I'm sure they were more aggressive. We have lots of data to support that. And in 2020, you can bet that all of these companies are going to go all out. And the methods that they're using are invisible. They're subliminal. They're more powerful than most any effects I've ever seen in the behavioral sciences. And I've been in the behavioral sciences for almost 40 years. You know, our Democratic colleagues on this committee often talk about what they view as the pernicious effect of big money and big corporate dollars. Uh, what you are testifying to is that a handful of Silicon Valley billionaires and giant corporations are able to spend millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars collectively, massively influencing the results of elections. And there's no accountability. You said, we don't know. We have no way of knowing if Google or Facebook or Twitter sends it, sends it to Democrats or Republicans or how they bias it because it's a black box with, 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 with no transparency or accountability whatsoever. Am, am I understanding <clears throat> you correctly? Senator, with respect, I must correct you. Please. If Mark Zuckerberg chooses to send out a go vote reminder just to Democrats on election day, that doesn't cost him a dime. Fair enough. Um, do you happen to know who the Hillary Clinton campaign's number one financial supporter was in the year 2016? Uh, I think I do, but please remind me. The, the number one financial supporter of the Hillary Clinton campaign in the 2016 election was the parent company of Google, Alphabet, oh, yeah. who was our first witness. They were her number one financial donor, and your testimony is, through their deceptive search methods, they moved 2.6 million votes in her direction. I would think anybody, whether or not you favor one candidate or another, should be deeply dismayed about a handful of Silicon Valley billionaires having that much power over our elections to silently and deceptively shift vote outcomes. Again, with respect, I must correct you. The 2.6 million is a rock bottom minimum. Mm. The range is between 2.6 and 10.4 million, depending on how aggressively they used the techniques that I've been studying now for six and a half years. Wow, could, could you say that again, please? Just The 2.6 million is a rock bottom minimum. The range is between 2.6 and 10.4 million votes, depending on how aggressive they were in using the techniques that I've been studying such as the search engine manipulation effect, the search suggestion effect, uh, the answer bot effect, and a number of others. They control these, and no one can counteract them. These are not competitive. These are tools that they have at their disposal exclusively. If any head headline comes out of this hearing, that should be it. Senator. My research demonstrates that different search terms will yield different kinds of results? Well, that, that is your, the whole point of what your testimony is from what I gather. You can get all kinds of results based on what your inquiry is. And if people actually got the, if they were told what's, uh, what in inquiry to put in, I think you're gonna get different kind of results. And Senator, excuse me, just for a second, um, these are very simple shifts in syntax that have very different ideological bases. So something like gun rights versus gun control have different ideological positions encoded into them. Senator, may I reply br briefly? Yes, well, we're well aware of that. So obviously, uh, we started with more than 500 terms. We narrowed it down to 250, and we had those rated by independent raters. We only used search terms that were not biased in one direction or another. And again, that's based on ratings by independent raters. We're, we're acutely aware of these kinds of issues, and we control for them. 
Are you going to possibly undertake a study of uh, how Russia's interference with our elections, uh, what kind of impact that had? Are you embarking on that study? We've looked into okay. that, Senator. Uh, I'm very interested in it. I think it's reprehensible uh, that this kinds of thing, this kind of thing happens. But um, in fact, Russia was using uh, several techniques, but mainly targeted ads and. The problem there is they're now in a, in a world, in an environment that's highly, highly, highly competitive. People also can see ads, so they can, you know, use their judgment and uh, confirmation bias plays a role in how they react to ads. And uh, study you did that, that you talked about probably has all those kinds of factors as, uh, as being uh, um, complicating the picture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Epstein, uh, Senator Rona uh, questioned your methodology and, and, and also said that uh, there were similar problems with search results as there are with ads. I, I want to give you a full opportunity simply to, to respond to those criticisms and, and explain the methodology you used. Uh, well, sure, ads <clears throat> um, and fake news stories for that matter, they're visible and they're competitive. So there have always been those kinds of manipulations. Go back 100 years, there have always been fake ads. Uh, there have always been fake news stories. Uh, and they're competitive. That's a competitive environment. You put up your, your billboard, I put up my billboard. The problem with the techniques that I've been discovering uh, and quantifying is that they're brand new. Uh, the internet has made them possible. They've never been possible before in human history. And they're controlled entirely and exclusively by Google and to a lesser extent Facebook. They're brand new. They, I had, I've had to put names on them one by one as I've discovered them because they're so bizarre. One quick example, we've shown in our experiments uh, that just by manipulating search suggestions, those phrases that are flashed at you when you're typing in a search term, we can turn a 50-50 split among undecided voters into a 90-10 split with no one having the slightest idea that they have been manipulated. We have reason to believe... Can you, can you put some specificity on that? I don't know if that example can be fleshed out. But Well, yes, in fact, we did that um, using uh, the names of presidential uh, candidates, and we flashed... Uh, search suggestions as people were typing letters, uh, and we deliberately withheld negative search suggestions from some of our participants, and with other participants, now and then we allowed a negative to show up on the list. Well, when you show a negative on the list, and right now if you look up Donald Trump is, you will find one negative. When you put a negative on the list, that draws 10 to 15 times as many clicks as neutral or positive terms. So if your algorithm suppresses negative search terms, uh, search suggestions, I should say, for one candidate, uh, as we know Google did for Hillary Clinton, my candidate in 2016, but you allow negatives to appear now and then for the opposing candidate, those negative search suggestions draw a tremendous amount of traffic to websites that show that candidate in a negative light. And what I'm telling you is we have shown that using this technique, we can turn a 50-50 split among undecided voters into a 90-10 split with no one having the slightest idea they have been manipulated. We have reason to believe that Google is knowingly, deliberately, strategically manipulating people's thinking and behavior from the very first character people type into the search box. And, and uh, Dr. Epstein, can, can you elaborate? You said we have reason to believe that Google is doing this knowingly and deliberately. Can, can you explain why, why we have reason to believe that? Well, pull out your cell phones. If you, if you type the letter A into Google's search box, by the way, you should never, ever use Google.com, never, because it tracks you. Uh, you should use uh, either something like DuckDuckGo or my favorite is called StartPage, startpage.com, which has full access to Google's index. But the point is, if you type the letter A into the search box, depending on <clears throat> your relationship with Google and how much they know about you, 
uh, there's a very good chance that you're going to see Amazon listed in the first position, second position, third position, maybe all three positions. Guess what? Amazon is Google's largest advertiser, and Google sends more traffic to Amazon than any other company. These are business partners, and Google is trying to send you to Amazon when you type the letter A. Type in the letter G. If for what it's worth, I just typed A. I got Amazon, Area 51 Raid, <laughs> and Amazon Prime. So those are the three Google suggestions, two of which are Amazon. Wow, that's, that's actually something, because I'm assuming you don't block them in any, any way, so they know all about you, and they're still trying to send you to Amazon and Amazon Prime. But type in the letter G, and you'll get something different. If you type in the letter G, there's a good chance you're going to get a list of Google products. They're trying to send you to Google. And the lesson here for all of us is, if you start a company, make sure the name of it does not begin with the letter G. Thank you very much. Thank you to each of you for very illuminating testimony. I appreciate your being here. I want to thank all the witnesses who testified before the subcommittee. Uh, we will be keeping the hearing record open for an additional two weeks, which means the record will be closed at the end of the business day on Tuesday, July 30th, 2019, senators uh, may submit follow-up questions to witnesses by that date, and, and if there are follow-up questions, the witnesses are asked uh, to respond as soon as possible in, in writing. And with that, uh, this hearing was not sponsored by the letter G, and this hearing is adjourned.